Amen. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I want to look at verse 1 and then we'll look at the preceding verses later. Um, he says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant, how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Now he starts here with saying, Moreover, brethren, he just finished discussing the dire need to preach the gospel with a spirit of humility. Amen. Not the Nicolaitan my way or the highway. Um, but anyway, six times the Apostle Paul states between Romans all the way to 2 Thessalonians, I would not have you to be ignorant. Amen. Most people today in churches are ignorant of salvation. They're ignorant of the doctrine of the church. They're ignorant of where the Word of God is and what it is. They're ignorant of how the Spirit of God moves. Amen. So a pastor's job is to preach where people are not ignorant. Amen. Ignorance is not bliss when it comes to spirituality. Amen. So we're not just here. Uh, I'm not just here to pacify and avoid trouble until God calls me somewhere else. All right. I'm here to make sure that myself and our church is not ignorant. Amen. Or as somebody told me one time out in Oklahoma, ignorant. You're just ignorant, amen? So, but I was ignorant to what... Anyway, ignorant means unknown, something unknown, unacquainted, un unacquainted. If you're ignorant of something, you don't know it. And that's kind of a passive understanding of ignorance. Uh, I, I just didn't know I was ignorant. I didn't know the speed limit was this, the sign was down, or I didn't see it. I, I didn't know. That's a passive ignorance. But then there's an active ignorance where we hear of zeal without knowledge. Yes. Amen. Um, Romans 2, uh, 10, verses 2 and 3 says, For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant. Do you see what's being said there? They're ignorant, and but, but they're active in their ignorance. <laughs> Amen. They were ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves under the righteousness of God. Listen, since I've been in the ministry, I've met a lot of those with zeal without knowledge. And at first, it's kind of cute. But after a while, if that doesn't change, man, it can really get on your nerves and harm your ministry. Uh, you know, like one guy will read, well, look, uh, praying with head covered and keep me on the phone for three hours telling me how he's going to bring his wife to church with her head covered with, with a doily or whatever that thing's called. They put on their head. And that's a zeal, and you can appreciate a zeal, but, but it's a zeal without knowledge. And it means you're ignorant. And uh, he's talking about here Jews that are lost. Amen. So I, I, don't, I don't pat somebody on the back that ze has zeal without knowledge. I have to give them knowledge <laughs> so they can have zeal with knowledge. Amen. That's, yep. that's a much better thing. But anyway, today... I want to talk about being ignorant and how not to be ignorant. Amen. Um, and I want to look at three truths here that I believe we can uh, summarize uh, chapter 10, uh, uh, especially verses 1 through uh, 15, uh, about we should not be ignorant concerning some things. Amen. Like, for instance, number one, be not ignorant that we as a church body, as individuals in this body, we are cut from the same stone. Jesus called Peter Cephas, which means a chip off the stone. That's what that means, a chip off the old block. As it says here, we've been baptized in one body. He said our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and we're all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Thereby, if we are all baptized in one body, it must be important to understand that each member's spiritual health affects the other members. Right. Amen? Uh, because we're headed in the same direction. And if somebody stops, you know, imagine two million people trying to go through the Red Sea while the waters were uh, heaped up. And keep moving. Could you imagine? Move, move, move. Because if somebody stops and goes, Mommy, look at the... They get trampled. <laughs> right. Amen. And people start backing up and so on. Or people start turning around and go the other way. Now they're messing up things. We're all one bread. And we are to work without leaven. Amen. So we're all baptized in one body. We're cut from the same stone. 
We have the same spiritual meat. Amen. Not one of us gets meat from somewhere else and then, then others get meat from the Bible. It's the same spiritual meat. Verse 3 says, And did all eat the same spiritual meat. Amen. They ate manna from heaven. Right. And right here in my hands and sitting on this pulpit is the real manna from heaven. Amen. And that is the word of the living God. Right. Amen. So we're baptized into one body and we move the same way and we eat the same spiritual meat because we're cut from the same stone. Amen. But we also uh, drink the same spiritual drink. In verse 4 it says, And did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Right. Amen. Now, I don't believe really that the rock followed them. I believe the, the big river <laughs> that flowed from the rock followed them is what I believe. It's still connected to the rock. Uh, as it is today, uh, Christ is not here among us following us, but all oh, that river of life is with us constantly. Amen. And that is His Spirit to, gives us gifts and so on. And we recognize these things that were cut from the same stone, especially when we go to the Lord's table and we find that He gives us the living water, the Spirit of God that works in our hearts to obey the ordinance Amen. and to see the ordinance for what it is. It is the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. And to realize we are one body and we are associated with his body and that we should all go the same direction and we should not be ignorant. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Um, be not ignorant. What we do affects the body. Right. Boy, when you read 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and I believe it's verses uh, 27 through 30, and you find that many people are, are unqualified for the Lord's Supper. And it causes harm in the body. He said that many are weakly and sickly and many sleep among you. People get sick. People get uh, sin in their lives because they're ignorant. Yes. Amen. I don't want us to be ignorant. Hallelujah. The Bible says in Romans 14, 7, For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. Amen. We are all one spiritual meat, one spiritual drink, all baptized into one body. We're of that same rock that was Christ. Amen. Right. We cannot be ignorant. So let's move on. Verses 5 through 10, we see that one individual can destroy a church. That's right. It absolutely can happen. Look at uh, verse 5. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Don't you know those 12 spies, 10 of them came back. 10 people gave a bad report and it overthrew everybody. That is just insane, isn't it? Well, it's because they were ignorant. He's telling us here in this chapter not to be ignorant like they were. In Ecclesiastes 9.18, it says, Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroyeth much good. Right. I say that all the time when I'm in traffic. One sinner destroyeth much good. <laughs> Amen. But anyway, he goes down a list of things that they did and things that happened to them. Oh God, may we in this church not be ignorant and have these things happen to us. But anyway, he begins in verse 6, and we find that lust and covetousness started taking over the body. He says, Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Now, <clears throat> one of the reasons that this happened is we find in Numbers 11, where it talks about this very event, is that it was a mixed multitude that fell a lusting. Right. Amen. What's going to keep us from lusting the world's music and the world's appetites and the things the world can offer from this church is to maintain our mission statement, maintain and protect our baptism and our table Amen. the best we can. Amen. So that we're not stuck with a mixed multitude that's going to cause the saints to be overthrown. Amen. God doesn't want that. We would be ignorant. Amen. Um, anyways, they despised manna. 
That's how you know it's a mixed multitude. When they don't want the Word of God, when they don't want to hear what's being taught, but instead they wanted the leeks and the garlic and the melons of Egypt. Now I want to tell you something. Uh, uh, I guess that's fancy food. But man, would you rather have the sweet taste of, of manna, which tasted like a fe- fresh, break, baked, sweet bread sweetened with coriander? Or would you rather have a leek, a garlic, or a melon? I'll take the melon out of all those. But just think about that. That's what the world has to offer. It may be powerful. It may be pungent. It may be pleasing. Somebody write that down so I can have an alliterated message later. But look where they are. Look at the taste of that. Look at what they're crying for. That manna is Christ, we know. Amen. That manna was placed in the Ark of the Covenant. Amen. Anyway, they despise the manna. I want to tell you what preaching does. It keeps us from being ignorant. And you know what it does? It chides your flesh. Yes. Amen. That's what preaching does. It Amen. chides your flesh. Not your spirit. Amen. And any preacher worth his salt knows the difference. You don't just beat down someone's spirit, you beat down their flesh. And if they get mad over the flesh, that means they're fleshly, they've opposed themselves. And you really don't want that to happen, but the preacher's not there to prevent that from happening. He's there to preach it. Our job is to understand, don't be ignorant. We're cut from the same stone and one of us in the flesh can do in many others. We've seen it here. We've already seen that here. Amen? So, the lust and covetousness can destroy a church. Look at verse 7. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Aaron was included with that. Aaron's a saint. Right. Aaron was included with that. That's what happens when we start letting a mixed multitude in. A multitude of ignorance. This is from Exodus 32 where they worshiped the golden calf. But they were stating, now get this, they were, they were worshiping a golden calf, but they were stating that this is a representation of the Lord. That they're worshiping the Lord. And Aaron even led in that. Ignorant. But their ignorance led to idolatry. I wonder how God puts up with idolatry. He don't. We'll talk about it in just a second. But this preacher serves not only to chide the flesh and and with the preaching, he also serves to teach us how to worship God. Not just worship God, but how to worship God. Amen? That's that's why uh, the song service and everything just kind of comes through me. And we've had one that just couldn't stand me saying, let's do this or let's do that. He had no idea about liberty of worship and people giving testimony. All he cared about was his agenda of of this is the way I want to do it. This is the way I think it should be done. Well, it was done that way in Exodus 32 and it ended up in a golden calf. We're not going to do that. We're going to do it the best way the New Testament teaches us to worship. And we're going to worship God Almighty and we're not going to be ignorant about it. Amen. Amen. I mean, right now there is a little bit of ignorance in our church with worship and praise. There is. The Bible says very clearly that we're allowed to do some things that if we did them in here, we would probably fall over with a heart attack. But we can. Like clapping hands. Praise God. Praise His name. Glory to God. Amen. Raising your hands. Things like that. But everybody's so afraid that it's going to turn fleshly and it's going to get out of control. I want to tell you, that's the preacher's job. I'm not here to beat you down. If worship starts getting out of control and if our women start teaching us instead of giving testimony and things like that, it's my job to get up there and just show you from the Bible how to worship. Not beat you up, amen. Show you how to worship. And then we can worship in those confines. And you say, well, if it's true worship, it won't be confined. It's in the confines of God if He wants to accept it. Amen. He's going to accept His worship. Amen. I, I, I believe that we could do a lot more with worshiping God. I really do. And I believe we shouldn't be ignorant of these things. And I think that we shouldn't be afraid to try these things. Amen. And just shout glory to God at times and so on. As long as it's decent and in order and it's not interrupting the teaching of the Word of God. I want to tell you something. I may be ignorant in some things, but I don't want to stay ignorant in some things. So we're going to keep preaching the Bible. Amen. Amen. Notice how I'm going verse by verse here. Why? So we know what God's trying to say. 
not putting together a sermon where I think it's right. Amen. So anyway, um, look at the next verse. Verse 8, Neither let us commit fornication as some of them did, committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Now, I want you to know, um, it, it, there, there's a, some people say, well, wait a second, Numbers 25.9 said it was 24,000 that fell in one day. And that is true, it does. There's not a discrepancy, but there were some that were uh, killed by the sword and some that were hanged. And the ones that were taken by the sword were 20 and 3,000. The other thousand were hanged. Amen. Just so you know that. Anyway, or vice versa. I may have that backwards. Um, because, you know, something in a service can hit somebody's mind. And they go, you know, I, I thought the Bible said, and the next thing you miss the whole thing that you're trying to be taught. Right. <laughs> so I try to hit those kind of things and kind of get them out of the way. But this Numbers 25, that, this is where it's from. Verses 1 through 9, where the Midianitish woman was brought into the camp and they were in open fornication. Yeah. And uh, if you remember, um, it was um, Phineas that, that came in and, and ran a, a javelin right through the couple. Amen. Just nailed them right to the ground with it and ended it. Now, we don't have that authority in church. So if the pastor's doing something wrong, you don't have the authority to get a javelin and, and, and you know, Nail him to the wall with it. Okay, amen. Uh, but anyway, that's what he did. Well, the, it started with idolatry. That's where everything starts. Okay? Right. And it ended, or, or then it went through a perverted uh, twist on worship. As a matter of fact, it starts off saying they worshiped Baal Peor. Yep. Baal Peor. Baal means Lord. Okay? So you can actually use the word Baal for the Lord, but he's given us other ways to do it. Just by itself, the word Baal means Lord. But when you put it together in a name, it's Lord of something. Um, like Baal's above. Anybody know what that is? Lord of the flies. Amen. Well, Baal Peor is called Lord of the Gap. Lord of the Gap. And there's a couple reasons he's called that. One is because he's an Amorite. And, uh, and Moabite God. They had different names like Chemosh and so on. Same God, okay? Uh, and where they were, there was a huge gap in the mountains and so on. That may be why. But the real reason, I believe, is because this God is always seen with His legs spread open. Or her legs spread open. Have you seen Starbucks? And you look real close and you see this mermaid's face and you see these two little fish tails up next to her. Well, what that is, if you get the whole picture, that's her spreading herself open. Yeah. That's what that is. Did y'all know that? Yeah. It's exactly what it is. It's a false God. So what happens is, and, and boy, I want to tell you, people would expose themselves to the God. In honor of that God, they would come worshiping without undergarments on. And when they got down to pray and bow, their hind ends were sticking out. God fought that. He says, when you're in the tabernacle, priest, I want to tell you something. You're going to have this long of a garment. You're going to have stuff underneath because when you go up that altar, you will not reveal nakedness. That's right. God did that on purpose. Amen. So nobody could link the two. You understand? Well, that's what happens. See, is in ignorance, we'll start linking. Somebody will come into church. Hey, brother, I was on the internet all weekend. Oh, boy, here it comes. Mm -hmm. Well, I saw this thing called the circle maker. And man, you draw a big circle around this building and you ask for God to bring revival into that circle. And hey, man, he'll bring revival into that circle and all that. It's a new thing. It's an ignorant thing. It's someone who is ignorant of the word of God. Amen. Well, we got this new thing called Jabez prayer. If you pray exactly what Jabez did, you'll have the success that Jabez had. Really? Okay, so everybody in church, let's do Sunday school lessons on it. And let's start praying on Jabez's prayer. Let's get the books. Ignorant. Yeah. That is nothing more than going into Belpior. That's what that is. We're going into the Lord of the Gaps. Amen. We're twisting our worship. It started with idolatry. So where is the idolatry? We want more numbers in our church. There it is. There's the idolatry. So what are we going to do to get those numbers? See, we're already ignorant by saying, what are we going to do? Mm -hmm. You see how ignorant that is? And so here they are. Now they're worshiping uh, with a twist. And the next thing you know, in their lives, they were fornicators. Right. 
That's, that's the progression. That's what happens. That, that's what happens with ignorance is fornication. Preaching develops discernment. That is to cut fornication out of your life. Whether it's TV, preachers, books, whatever. Cut it out of your life. Amen? How about this? Going to verse 9. Look what they were doing. Tempting the Lord. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. That comes from Numbers 21. They actually stood up against God's plans. You notice the progression here? They're saying, we don't want this anymore. We don't like this. We don't like the leader. We don't like being out here. We don't like the food. We, we don't have no money. Where's my farm? Where, I don't have anything. Get, give, me my, give me my check. <laughs> Amen. It's kind of the mentality. Well, God sent fiery serpents among them. Can you imagine not only serpents biting you? That's a nightmare. The serpents of fire biting you? And that's what was going on. God dealt with them personally. Each person that acted that way, God dealt with them and started biting them. It was a plague. But don't you know it affected all the godly ones that weren't complaining as well? Mm -hmm. You had to round up your family and move. You had to get out of that mess. Look at the snakes. You didn't stand around and go, well, I wasn't griping, so one of these isn't going to bite me. I'm going to tell you, I see a fiery serpent. I'm going the other way. Right. Amen. And that's what was going on. It just split everything up because people were rebellious and it was all based on ignorance. And they started tempting God. And you know, all they had to do to look and live was to look back at the serpent on the pole. You know, that's all we have to do. If we're in ignorance today and you hear a message that chides your flesh and it causes you to want to oppose yourself, all you got to do is look back to Christ. That If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Praise God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. They had to look back at Him again. Amen? Amen. So preaching reproves. Preaching rebukes. Preaching exhorts. Why? So we won't be ignorant. Amen. That's why. That's then look at the next one. They were murmuring. Yeah. Look at verse 10. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Mm. It means they were complaining. We need new leadership. Look where Moses has led us. Look how ignorant these people are. Right in front of them was the fiery uh, Spirit of God on the tabernacle leading them. Yep. And, a, and a cloud by day and a fire by night. Look how ignorant they are. We need to get rid of Moses. We're, we're sick of him and Aaron and Joshua and Caleb. We need to get rid of them and do it our own. And I want to tell you what happens. This all comes from a root of bitterness. A root of bitterness. Some ignorant soul has gotten in the flesh and now they become bitter. Yeah. And many are defiled. That has happened here in our church. I saw it coming. I, I said for a year out, we need a revival. Our people are going to be hurt. And we started preaching on things that was definitely in people's lives that needed some help. Yeah. And when I started reproving, uh, rebuking and exhorting, people got mad in their bitterness and they started spreading that bitterness and there were many defiled. 2 Corinthians 2.11 says, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices I want to tell you something when you get the word of God preached to you it gets right to the root of the problem it comes straight from God and his word why so you won't be ignorant Amen. you know how churches split you know how men fall by the wayside it starts with people being ignorant right. of what idolatry is and so on so what have we learned we're cut from the same stone Number two, one individual can destroy a church yes. through bitterness. Number three, each member must be right with God. Each member must be right with God. Amen. Look at verse 11. Now all these things happen unto them for in samples that they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. You know what? It's so we won't be ignorant. Yeah. Reject ignorance. Some people have said some of the most amazing and hurtful things because they're ignorant. Yes. 
They don't realize what's really going on or they don't realize what the Bible actually says. Or they want to superimpose, well, I always thought, well, you're the one that got saved six months ago. Relax. Okay, you could be right, but ignorance makes you bow up and act stupid. Right. Right? Amen. <laughs> Go to other people. I don't, what do you think about it? I don't agree with what he said. What do you think about that? Right. Right? That's ignorance. Let's reject it. Let's reject ignorance. I want to be smarter. I want to be more wise in the Word of God, don't you? Amen. Amen. Number two, I know this is hard to get, <laughs> but what we think, our thoughts, are usually different from what God thinks or God's thoughts. And I'm not talking about in a mystic way. I'm talking about what the Word of God says versus what we think. Look at verse 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Only an ignorant man would say, I can't fall. Amen? So let's always remember, things are different. We can justify a lot of things with the world. But I'm going to tell you, God thinks different than we do. Number three. We have to understand that when we are ignorant, when we are in sin, when we are wrong, when we are right with God, no matter our situation, that God is always faithful. Amen. Verse 13, There hath no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Did you notice that it was there? The escape is not to run away from the temptation. The escape is to help us bear it. Go through it. Whether that's persecution or the results of our sins or the results of our ignorance. God is still faithful. Amen. Amen. He's still faithful. Now, here's a summary. In verse 14, he says, Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Now, he'd already mentioned idolatry, didn't he, specifically? But what he's given us here is a summary of everything he's listed. Starts with idolatry. And idolatry can be as simple as the wrong motive. Yes. Amen. Be not ignorant. God will judge idolatry. It's the first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Amen. It's also uh, the whole reason. Idolatry is the entire reason of why the seven vials of judgment of wrath are poured out in Revelation. Read it and you'll see. It's because of their idolatry. So, if we have a course set before us and the Word of God says something or it's very clear from, from teaching of doctrine to take a certain way, but yet we justify another way, we must be ignorant. Yes. We're not to be ignorant. Right. Amen? Uh, idolatry is a sin. Even if we commit idolatry over a good thing, even if it's ignorant, it's still a sin. Amen, Let me give you some, some examples here. Like for instance, my personal rights. I'm an American, I have personal rights. Matter of fact, I have liberty given from God and America can't take it away. They can kill me for it, it'd be unlawful, but they can't take away my liberty before Christ. Amen? They can't do it. However, I want you to listen to something. 1 Corinthians 6, 7 says, Now therefore there is utterly a fault among you, because you go to law one with another. Why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Amen. Do you know when the Antichrist takes over and you can't buy or sell? What are you going to do about that? Well, you can't buy or sell. You're not going to buy or sell no matter how much you try. You're not going to, cash will be of no value to you. Every hundred billion dollar bill you've got will be of no value to you. And to keep trying to use it would be ignorant. Amen. We have to understand that there's a principle of personal liberty. That is correct. And we're teaching it in the book of Galatians. And thank God, what a blessing that's been. 
But at the same time, if my liberty causes a stumbling block to someone else, it is now no longer liberty. It is a sin. Amen. It's like we talked today, uh, me and PJ were talking about, you know, we're here gathering in church. Well, they're not going to say much to us because of our number, but I don't care if there's two million of us. We're going to meet in church. Amen. And the ones that don't, they don't. They went out from us because they were not of us. Amen. We're going to meet in church. We're going to do it. But to go and call the government and say, nanny, nanny, boo, boo, and stick a stick in the eye of the beast, that would be pretty ignorant when you say that'd be ignorant. Sometimes we, the best thing to do when we defy, I mean, like for instance, I carried for years uh, without a permit. I carried. I didn't go, hey, look, Mr. Police Government guy, I got a gun and it's my ride and you can't stop me. No, what I did was kept my mouth shut. And that way, if someone ever tried to hurt my family at the mall, I can at least defend them. Amen. In other words, I'm talking about sometimes we need to suffer in silence. Amen. Let's be careful about that. We don't want to be ignorant. Let me give you another one. Not only my personal rights, which I, by the way, I, I need to get a little less ignorant about that because I so want to stand up. First time somebody wants to naysay me, I want to stand up. So I, I need to be a little bit more like Christ in that he did submit to Pilate. He treated Pilate like a leader. Just, just think about that. Amen? How about this? A church. A church can become an idol. That's the whole reason we have Nicolaitanism. is because the church has become an idol, and so is the preacher. Amen? My church, my church this, church this, church that. People will not leave a church when they see that another church is right scripturally and theirs is wrong scripturally. They will not leave it because that's their idol. Amen? Let me tell you something. You're ignorant. Salvation did not come through the church. Amen? God's uh, saving power, justification, sanctification did not come through the church. Amen? It's the blood of Christ then the water. Amen. Christ, then the church. Amen. That's the way it works. The church can become an idol. Flee idolatry. Amen. Walk with God. Don't be ignorant. It's ignorant to be in pastor worship and church worship when you could be in Christ worship by the Spirit of God. Let me give you another example. And by the way, these are examples I've all, they're for me. I've, I've lived through. Here's another one, and this is a huge idol, and that is sometimes our family can be an idol. If we compromise, now get a hold of this. Well, let me read to you this first. Matthew 10, verse 34. Think not that I'm come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Now let me clarify a misnomer here. And I want to make sure that this is very clearly recorded. I do not believe for a second that now that I'm saved, I should go to war against my family members. Amen. No, by me being saved, they go to war against me. Do, do you see the difference there? Some people will turn that, in, turn that into an idol uh, and will just go to war against their family members instead of just trying to do what they can to live peaceably among all men. They'll do what they can to go, see, uh-huh, I showed you, let me prove it to you. I've been guilty of a little bit of that in my life. And you know what that is? Straight up ignorance. <laughs> Amen. But the, but the bigger problem is somehow we as Christians think that we can compromise the Word of God uh, for, for our family. You know, I, like I said, I think it was Wednesday night, I, I used to, or maybe I said it earlier, we, we used to, uh, I'd want to miss church and have family time. Remember that? When's the last time I did that? Yeah, when I was lost. Amen. It was the last time I did that. I think you have a recording of it somewhere, and I don't ever want to see it, but you have a recording of us on the family picnic that day instead of church. And I'm going to tell you what, since I got saved, that doesn't happen anymore. 
uh, because I learned something. And I'm going to tell you who taught it to me. It was Brother BJ. Because I had a little bit of, I would try to compromise a little bit. Like I'd go home for Christmas and hate the Christmas tree and hate the presents and hate their songs and all that. And I'd just sit there among them, but I'd be trying to point him to Christ and trying to point him to Christ. You can't do that. It won't work. You can't get involved in Baal worship and expect to win your family. It won't work. Right. So what I did is it was BJ that told me, and I mean, he told me over 20 years ago, he said, you'll never win your family by compromising Scripture. Amen. Amen. And what's happened is my family became an idol. Even though it was a small idol in my heart, it was a big enough idol that it caused me to compromise who I am and what I do for my, quote, family. Man, let me continue reading this. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Man, that's hard. We want to win our family so much, don't we? I know I do. And I know when you have lost family, and if you're like me, you raised your family wrong until you got saved. <laughs> Amen. And you got lost family and uh, they want to come home for the holidays because it's the only time that the government and the bosses and everybody gives them time off. And they want to come home for the holidays. But you say, well, now, yeah, you can come home now. We're not going to do Christmas. Oh, oh, well, uh, something came up and you realize that you just lost that fellowship with the ones you love most dearly besides the body of Christ. And I can see it. It's a real world thing. But let me tell you, it's ignorance. If you think that you can compromise that. Say, okay, okay, bring your presents. We'll let you guys hand your presents out and all that. If you compromise that, and I know I'm talking about Christmas, I don't know why, but there's a million other ways. If you compromise that, you're not helping your family. Amen. You're actually hurting your family. That's, we're ignorant. That doesn't mean we're stupid. It just means Whoa, I didn't see that before. <laughs> you know, amen. And I had to learn that, that I was being ignorant. Now, here's the best part of the whole message. Let me, let me just kind of recap so we know what we're saying. I'm talking about being ignorant. Paul tells us not to be ignorant. And so to, to not be ignorant, we had to learn that we were cut from the same stone, that an individual can, can do the work that can ultimately destroy a church through sin, and that each member must be right with God. That's what the Lord table, Lord's table is all about anyway. Each member must be right with God. Now watch this. Verse 15. I speak as to wise men. Judge ye what I say. In other words, I'm not talking to a bunch of ignorant fools here this morning. I'm talking to people who love God and love Jesus, love the Bible. Amen. Understand some principles of the Bible. And what Paul's saying here is, judge it. You know, I'm laying it out here for you to judge what I'm saying, if it's right or wrong. Amen? And I do the same here. I'm saying, judge it. Matter of fact, the book of Ephesians tells us in chapter 5, and I think it's in verse 11, prove all things to prove what's acceptable to God. Prove all things. Amen? Let us as a church not be ignorant. We don't want to be ignorant of what's going on with this corona stuff. Uh, it's, it's not a, the disease is not a hoax. It's real. But what's going on with it is a hoax. Okay? We're not ignorant of that. We're not ignorant of what's going on with uh, the war against terrorism. We're, we're not ignorant about vaccinations and things like that. We're pretty smart about those things. We're not ignorant of the Antichrist system and what he's going to try to do to us as a church by to, to wear out the saints. Amen. Because that's coming. We're, going to do, we're not ignorant of that. We already know that. And look, we're here. Amen. We know that. But we also cannot be ignorant of things that can chew us up on the inside. We've got to be, we've got to be wise to salvation. Right? And simple concerning evil. Amen? All right, we'll close right there. God bless you this morning. I hope that was a blessing to you. Amen. Let's uh, pray. We'll be dismissed.